many cultures tell the story of a great flood. Chinese mythology speaks of torrential rains being set upon the earth by an angry water god, flooding the land for years. One man didn't look to escape from the flood or ride out the storm in an ark, but to overcome it. His name was Yu, and he built a series of dams and canals to channel the rising water to control its flow. He engineered order over the chaos, allowing his people to survive and to flourish. Yu would become emperor, and his deeds would become legend. Today, the story of modern China, 5,000 years in the making, is still a story of order. The struggle to keep it against the forces that would take it away. China is strong. We have the Belt and Road Initiative. The military is also expanding. Yet how can you argue that it's not perfectly poised to be the superpower? Chinese version of authoritarianism would not rest peacefully or content without influencing the whole world, reshaping the whole world in its own image. It is ingrained in the Chinese culture that being the top dog is no fun. And China has no desire to replace any country to be the top dog. Chairman Mao used to say, history, like everything else, must serve the people. Only the party represents the people. The party must control the narrative of history. China once ruled the waves. The Chinese Empire stretched across East Asia and its influence reached as far as the edges of Europe. For almost 2,000 years, from the 3rd century BCE, China was a leading world power, full of invention and adventure, a center of global trade. Underpinning the power and wealth was the ancient principle of order, which bound together a vast empire, keeping it from collapse. 25 to 2300 years ago, the Chinese world was united under one leadership. And that's when this very idea or very ideal of China order was put in practice. So for the first time, a single authority unified the whole known world. They call it the Chinese world or China as we call it today. At that time it's called the Qing. And that's where the word China comes from. The Qin Dynasty had emerged victorious from a prolonged period of wars between rival states, and in the year 221 BCE, it set about creating the first Chinese empire. It introduced a common currency and a standardized language across China. The Qin Imperial Project was built on a strategy designed for war, but repurposed to maintain peace. This system, known as legalism, applied strict laws and severe punishment as a way of keeping the empire and its people in order. Legalism emphasized on the use of force, clear use of force, discipline, control, and empowerish individuals so their state is strong, right? Legalism is pretty naked, kind of hardcore manipulation of human beings, if you will. Legalism was a ruthless strategy designed for state security and to keep state power. Its emphasis on order borrowed principles originally meant for social harmony that had emerged some three centuries earlier and based on the teachings of one man. Confucius is maybe the, the most important thinker for the whole history of China. Basically, his idea about the order 
is about the ritual. The ritual order is the order of heaven. If you are not follow the practice of ritual order, you can be thought as outsiders. The order really starts from within the family. The important social relations that are built within the family, so the father and son or parent and child, the key is, the, is relationality. Uh, whereas Western thinking prizes the individual and thinks of the individual's relationship to other things, but with the individual at the center, China, China has, is one of those cultures where relations are much more important. And people are defined, uh, in a sense, by roles. If a society observed these roles, lived by the high morality and shared respect for hierarchy that Confucius laid out, chaos and disorder would be kept at bay. But the Qin emperors renounced these lofty old traditions, relegating Confucianism and promoting legalism in its place. During this Qin Han period, we saw the rise of this philosophy known as legalism. Mm -hmm. What did legalism look like in a historical sense? So the relationship between the ruler and the root is defined almost like a, a man and a herds, a like sheep. You know, you manage the people, you rule them, right? That kind of relationship, top-down authority structure, is at the core. So to win, to govern at all costs, the power issue is clear there. So for that, you can talk all about the humanitarian, soft kind of uh, rituals uh, Confucianism is famous for, but you, rule, you govern with the rules of the force. Yeah. No, I it. would say in today's world, we will define uh, Confucianism as one of the three pillars of the Chinese civilization. And its key element, I would say, emphasizes order based on morality and ethics. Now, legalism basically would leave everything to the mercy of the law. If anyone is in violation of a law or a particular code, for example, then penalty or consequences will come after him. I would say Confucianism is very able to maintain stability for the long term. That's I'm really afraid I really have a problem with that. Legalism is actually very simple. It's using law and enforcing law in a very harsh way. Law is what the ruler lays down. Right. It's got nothing in terms of what people want or they don't want. Now, Confucianism is the really big issue. All that has been said in the name of Confucius for about 2,000 years, if you can bring poor old Confucius back from the grave, he cannot recognize them. <laughs> All the things that were done in his name were completely against what Confucius himself taught. In what way? Can you elaborate? If you reduce Confucianism to its most simple form, it's not about order, it's not about hierarchy, it's do the right thing in the judgment of history. It was subsequent emperors from the Second Empire, the Han Empire down, who tried to conscript Confucianism and gave it and elevated it into a kind of a state religion status. And then in the process, also mix it with legalism in order to have both the legal mechanism to control, as well as a kind of ability to claim a moral authority that you must all do this in the name of Confucius. In early imperial China, moral authority came from a source higher than human, something altogether more divine. The job of the ruler is to create order. And if you create order and you have a stable society and you help provide for your people, then you will have what we translate in English as the mandate of heaven. You will, you will be a legitimate ruler. The mandate of heaven, Tian Ming, was an ancient Chinese creed that bestowed moral authority on any would-be ruler. Without this mandate, an emperor lacked the divine right to rule. With it came the responsibility for what was called Tian Xia, literally everything under heaven, with China as the middle kingdom at its heart. A ruler is someone who doesn't simply impose himself. He's someone who helps lift people up, support them, or give them the means by which to support themselves. The key feature is this, an intimate connection between the ruler's success 
and the people's prosperity. The Qin's connection with the Chinese people, based on fear, was short-lived. Their mandate from heaven and authority over Tianxia was lost as the people rebelled against brutal Qin rule. In 206 BCE, that mandate was taken on by a new dynasty, the Han, who cloaked their legalism with a deliberate return to more merciful Confucian ideals. It was a masterstroke. The Han ruled for another 400 years. At the beginning of the 3rd century CE, China entered a golden age, 1600 years of unprecedented growth. The 3rd to the 19th century saw Chinese civilization bloom. The Silk Road, a trade route connecting China to Central Asia and the Near East, reached out ever further, growing China's commercial and cultural reach ever deeper, expanding the horizons of Tianxia. Following the Han, one ruling dynasty to another, Tang to Song, Ming to Qing, arts, science, culture, and commerce thrived. Pioneering advances in China's maritime and military technology increased its power and its influence. The Chinese exported silk, porcelain, and tea across continents, bringing new nations and new cultures into China's idea of all under heaven, and new challenges particularly from Europe, to its place at the center of the world. By the time we get to the 16th and 17th centuries, um, China has major merchant groups um, across different parts of the empire, as well as those who are trading with Southeast Asia. In this period of time, China is a very prosperous empire. China's standards of living and its commercial sophistication, in large measure, were the equal of that of Europeans into the 18th century. It really laid down the foundation of a peculiar Chinese political system. In practice, it continued all the way to the 19th century when the Europeans came in. China was uh, in many ways, Europe's equivalent economically um, in terms of its prosperity, certainly in terms of the numbers of people it could feed, and the stability of its political order is challenged in a new way in the 19th century by a new type of foreign power, led by the British, who have built the largest navy in the world. By this time, the British, you know, the colonial empire is expanding rapidly. They move into East Asia on the lookout for colonies. So they want to uh, have access to the Chinese market. Uh, they want to sell opium, which they've grown in India, to the Chinese. The emperor refuses and famously says, you know, you've got nothing to offer us. We're not interested in any of your goods. The whole idea was that for the sake of successful British trade, an entire gigantic nation could be turned into a nation of addicts. But the Chinese effort to resist this in the first Opium War was a disaster. The British, as part of their bounty, take Hong Kong, and this then becomes a process by which the British occupation of Hong Kong spreads over time into other major cities in China, the so-called treaty ports. So eventually, many of the most important uh, ports become under foreign control. The world's praying powers moved in on a wounded and bewildered China, shorn of its land and its certainty. Britain hived off the strategic port city of Hong Kong for itself, while France, Germany, Russia and the United States secured their own access to ports, as well as rights to trade their goods and to spread the word of their Christian faith. Defeat in a war against France would follow, but in 1894, defeat at the hands of an enemy closer to home would rock China to its core. What really caused the empires to get shaken was the war that the empire fought against Japan over their control of Korea. 
Korea was one of China's tributary states, and it lost. It was the idea that China was being defeated, not by some modern advanced European powers like the British Empire of Queen Victoria, but by an inferior neighbour, Japan. Now that really shook the empire up, and that was the point when things started to change in a dramatic way. They were so soundly defeated that they didn't know what had hit them. What you had from 1839 was defeat after defeat after defeat after defeat. At that point, Chinese emperor and the Chinese elites, they thought China, the Qin Dynasty, was the center, was the most powerful, most civilized nation. But to the big, their big surprise, they were defeated. Confusion and conflict reigned across China as it ceded territory to invading forces from overseas and battled rebellions at home. In 1911, the imperial system that had kept order for more than 2,000 years collapsed under the weight of a nationalist revolution. The Middle Kingdom was now a republic. The new nationalist republic joined the Allied forces in the First World War, only for China's contribution to be betrayed as the Treaty of Versailles ended the war and handed Chinese territory over to Japan. It was another slap in the face. On May 4th, 1919, angered by the impotence of their leaders, thousands of young Chinese took to the streets demanding political and cultural transformation. What came to be known as the May 4th Movement called for a move away from tired Confucian wars and was to lead the nationalists to reform the governing Kuomintang Party, the KMT, and remodel China's government. But at the same time, it inspired the formation of a rival political force. The Main Force Movement prepared for the Chinese Communist Movement, but actually, a lot of the ideas, a lot of the activists for the KMT movement were the same. It's that all share the common view that the older ideas are to be abandoned. So ushered in communist ideas, and then led to the creation of the Communist Party in 1921, and later on, gradually, the Civil War, and so on and so forth. These two distinct blocks, with two distinct visions, fought out a bloody civil war for the right to rule a chaotic, disordered China. By the mid-1930s, the KMT had the upper hand, forcing the communists to retreat on a long march north across rural China. It was this long march that saw the emergence of a leader who would be his party's and his country's destiny. The long march occurred when the communist forces decided to break out from the mountains in the south of China. Mao Zedong led that long march and that's when he emerged as the um, strongest leader in the Communist Party. The cadres of Mao would go into the villages and say, will you join us because the mandate of heaven is being lifted from those who are corrupt, those who have impoverished you, those who have given the country to the foreigners. Will you rise up with us? But in 1937, Japan invaded China for a second time. Nationalists and communists came together to fight the Japanese occupation as the Second World War convulsed the nations of the East and the West. The war would end in 1945. Japan would surrender. But China's communists and its nationalist government continued their own fight against each other. In that eight years of war, while the central government fought and lost a huge number of troops and equipment, the Communist Party focused on expanding. By the end of the war, the Communist Party had about a million men under arms. The Communist Party of China received an enormous absolutely enormous amount of military hardwares from 
the Soviet Union. China's civil war was now part of a new grand narrative. With Mao's CCP bolstered by the Soviet Union and the KMT, led by General Chiang Kai-shek, drawing its support from the United States. The US was investing a lot in China, and they were very much betting on their relations with the uh, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek's regime, as well as the Jiang family. And after the end of the Second World War, I think the United States made the wrong bet. The KMT lost the battle for China and embarked on a great retreat to the island of Taiwan, where it established the Republic of China. On October 1st, 1949, Mao would declare the mainland the People's Republic of China, signaling yet another shift away from a failed old order and the end of what many Chinese saw as a century of humiliation. The Chinese Communist Party under Mao, for the first time, had a very deep mobilization of the whole Chinese society for a political purpose. Mao tried to abandon all these unequal treaties with Western powers, so declared China as a modern nation state uh, to, should be treated equal by other nations. In 1950, Mao's modern nation state entered the Korean War, joining the Soviet Union on the side of the North against the US-backed South. China was to be reckoned with alongside the world's superpowers. It was a bold statement on the world stage. Mao Zedong would then turn to matters at home. Beginning with the so-called Hundred Flowers campaign in 1956, the Communist Party invited open debate on how China was being governed. So they said, let a thousand flowers bloom. Big trap. Yes, they bloomed. They said, oh, great. Now we're going to express ourselves and our criticisms and our different views. And then the purpose of the blooming was to have them expose themselves, actually. Dissenting voices were silenced. Critics were purged from universities and from the CCP many condemned to hard labor, some executed. Mao was imposing his own order. Confucian thought was replaced by Mao Zedong thought, set out in his little red book, and setting in place a strict authoritarian rule that was rooted in himself and in China's imperial past. Mao Zedong's leadership of China was being built on a harsh imposition of rules, at once lending from China's past, as well as trying to break from it. If we really analyze Mao Zedong's thought, the idea was quite ancient. Qing Han idea, basically, is a legalism wrapped up with imported communist physiology. Mao uh, was a master of legalism, right? He played legalist tricks better than most of his competitors. For his next trick, in 1958, Mao would try and transform China from a struggling agrarian society into an industrial powerhouse. Since the beginning of this year, the workers have enormously increased the variety of their products to meet the nation's needs. He called this transformation the Great Leap Forward. Since liberation, particularly the Big Leap Forward, it has made much headway in all fields of its work. It failed. Agriculture was neglected, and when China was hit by severe droughts, famine was endemic. 
a human catastrophe writ large across a faltering revolution. Estimates of the death toll ranged from 18 million to over 50 million. Now Mao blamed his policy failures on droughts, anti-communists, and liberal reformers sympathetic to Western capitalism who had to be removed. The public may have had an unshakable faith in their leader, but his authority at the top of the Communist Party was now vulnerable to rivals. And so in 1966, Mao would again lean on legalism, reigniting radical fervor among obedient young Chinese, to purge capitalists and reactionary forces from the communist project. He called this new plan the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. Millions died, including mobilizing young people who tortured or struggled to death teachers so we're talking about 12-year-olds, 14-year-olds, beating to death teachers. It was ultimately a vision that created massive unintended consequences. Um, by empowering people to rebel and to create authority in uh, distinction from the bureaucratic authority, under the guise of this movement, because of the breakdown of normal social and political order, um, created great chaos. As it neared its end at the turn of the 1970s, the Cultural Revolution had claimed upwards of two million lives and removed many of the most powerful challenges to what was now an ailing Mao Zedong. A Sikh leader was presiding over a Sikh country ravaged by the very policies designed to lift its malaise. China had been left behind by the international community, and now violent border disputes had also left it estranged from its Soviet ally. Mao was politically and physically weak, in need of a shot in the arm for his country and his command. It would come in early 1972, and from a most unexpected source. President Nixon was able to be a great statesman. And he realized that if he made a dramatic gesture to Mao, he might be able to overcome the extraordinary hostility and uh, lack of good faith between the United States and China at that time. Nixon, of course, had been a classic anti-communist. But uh, if a major communist country like China could be turned against the Soviet Union, that was seen as a uh, a major step in U.S. global strategy, uh, and more particularly with regard to the Vietnam War, where both China and the Soviet Union were helping North Vietnam. If one of them could be neutralized in some respect, that would help end the Vietnam intervention sooner rather than later. Following Nixon's visit, there is momentum to normalize relations, which is achieved finally in 1976. And that creates an economic space that will increasingly be taken advantage of. China began opening in a cautious way towards the rest of the world. Uh, Mao had no interest in transforming the system, and by now, Mao was no longer effective. He was pretty sick. In September 1976, Mao Zedong, the founding father of the People's Republic of China, died. The time for mourning Mao's death gave way to the need to fix the problems he'd left behind. In 1978, a new leader, Deng Xiaoping, twice purged from the CCP for pushing economic reforms, took on the Mandate of Heaven, 
and looked to purge China of Mao's folly. Mao was a Stalinist on steroid, with a destructive streak when it comes to culture, civilization, and the finer things in life for others. Nobody in Chinese history has done more to destroy Chinese civilization. That Maoist revolution was what held people in China back, to put it very mildly. And what that revolution that happened under the banner of communism, but failing, you don't think that Mao was communist at all. Can you explain more of right. that? Yeah, uh, in my view, he used communism like he used so many things to get power and to stay in power. So now looking back, the first 30 years, which is largely under Mao Zedong's dictatorship, was a tragic, very tragic detour of Chinese history. In other words, the Chinese spent so many lives, so much time, so much wealth, getting nothing other than stagnation. Mao Zedong tried to change China that was changed in the previous century. New China was actually quite an irony. Initially, it looks like new, but very quickly become a great leap backwards. Uh, allow me to disagree to a certain extent. Even though there are many bad economic decisions, the Chinese heavy industry development, for example, irrigation, and very importantly, land reform, was completed in the first 30 years of Mao's rule. Therefore, I think we need to be very objective as to what Mao did. He was not a 100% evil person. He was not a 100% good person, for example. He did huge, he made huge mistakes, but also, in essence, I think, if we think about Mao Zedong today, he was a great Chinese national. He had the guts to stand up. He had the guts to rally the Chinese people behind him. He had the guts to really stand firm on the world stage. He had the guts to stay in power forever. He had the guts to ruin the country, it's not a matter. His mission, his ambition was not just China. He wanted to liberate the whole humankind, if you will. When we were little, we were taught one day, which we were prepared to liberate the three quarters of human beings who are still suffering, unlike us. So that's our mission. And on the Tiananmen Gate today, there is still a slogan that says, long live the grand solidarity of the people of the world. Great solidarity of the people of the world under whom? That's the question. Victor, do you have that similar memory? Of no, I, I disagree with uh, the professor quite a lot. I would say, when Deng Xiaoping came back to power, uh, he was the paramount leader. And he was persecuted quite a few times By during Mao. the Cultural was, Revolution. Yes. So he probably had more reason than any other single person to really uh, 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 overturn Mao's position in the Communist Party of China or among the Chinese people. However, he said very objectively, and I think this is the greatness of Deng Xiaoping, that Mao was wrong 30% of the time, but he was right 70% of the time. When you look at Mao, you really need to look at his totality. He was a great man. He was a great poet, for example. He was a man of great impact, that's for sure. Whether you like him or not, Mao will be recorded in Chinese history whenever the Chinese nation would still survive. Steve, what was your memories of Mao? How do you see Mao? No, I don't remember Mao. I don't think we should be trying to remember Mao because as a personal emotional thing, we should be looking at Mao as a historical figure and be fair and objective with what he was. As to why Deng Xiaoping has to say that Mao Zedong was 70% right and 30% wrong, what else could he have said? He inherited power from Mao. He was one of the closest of Mao's lieutenants. The inheritance, in, inheritance of power was uh, transmitted through the Communist Party of China. If Deng Xiaoping were to tell and acknowledge the truth of Mao, the Communist Party would have zero legitimacy to stay in power in China in the late 1970s. How could he do so? Turkeys do not celebrate Christmas. Deng was not interested in continuing Mao's experiment in communism. He had been a victim of the great people's cultural revolution. He was going to 
make sure nothing like that ever happens again in China. China started its open air reform uh, era and abandoned more confrontational approach to Western power. Domestically, uh, China under Deng Xiaoping abandoned some of the Maoist social economic policy. Deng Xiaoping encouraged entrepreneurship, private sectors, even to some degree market economy. So China reformed its social economic system to give people more, so, more freedom, social economic freedom. He would call that system as socialism with Chinese characteristics. He basically said, what really mattered is productivity. And he used the famous saying, it doesn't matter whether a cat is black or white. What really matters is the cat, whatever its color, would catch mice. The signs of change are very evident in any Chinese village or town market. These are private stallholders selling their own produce. A touch of capitalism in a once doctrinaire communist state. Deng Xiaoping removed the shackles from Chinese entrepreneurship. He opened up China's foreign policy, extended the warm welcome to American leaders and their investment dollars. Deng's liberal economic reforms allowed for private ownership and the new special economic zones that gleamed like beacons of profit for Western businesses. Deng also restored China's Confucian bedrock. It was an attempt to revive an indigenous culture deeper than communism to help remodel a nation. But for the Chinese people, growing economic liberty would not be matched by greater political freedom. Deng Xiaoping laid down the limit of how much reform can go. So freedom of speech, political participation are limited by how much the party allows you. So you cannot uh, challenge the party's power. Modernizations meant you had to industrialize in the cities, but it also meant that you had to educate people. So you had the sudden advent of a much larger student class than before. These people were more free thinking than before, and at the same time, they were absolutely necessary. This general process of reform brought decisions by the Chinese leadership to send tens of thousands of students, ultimately hundreds of thousands of students abroad, with the hope that they would come home and use those skills to develop China. They were also exposed to other ideas in the West that were not narrowly economic. Ideas about culture, ideas about politics. And some of the students and Chinese who went abroad were quite attracted to what they saw. New ideas were splitting the Chinese Communist Party. Reformists played for increased liberalization, political as well as economic. While for hardliners, such ideas threatened to expose the party hierarchy as a house of cards. Despite the differences, party officials availed themselves of the opportunities opened up by private enterprise. Corruption was growing as fast as the new economy. Removing corrupt and incompetent officials, as well as unrepentant Maoists from public office, was a charge taken on by the CCP's reformist general secretary, Hu Yaobang. But in 1987, following weeks of student protests against state corruption and growing inequality, the CCP blamed Hu Yaobang for the unrest, forcing him to stand down. Two years later, in April 1989, he died of heart failure. His passing away was a moment for the Chinese nation to pause and to recollect its wits, for example, and to recall what happened in the Cultural Revolution, what happened since 1978. And I think lots of people at that time were not very happy about some of the political situations in China. Pause was lost to protest. Students felt aggrieved that Hu Yaobang's legacy was being disrespected by the CCP, pushing them, once again, to stand up against the state. Grief now merged with anger. Frustrations over corruption, rising prices, growing inequality, and limited political reform harked back to the May 4th movement 70 years earlier. 
By early June 1989, heated passions simmered on the streets of Beijing. A toxic brew was about to boil over. I remember on the 6th of June, I went to the Tianmen广场. That day, I was the only one that I didn't wear a camera. I always wear a camera to take a photo. That day, I felt that my feeling was very good. Then, I went to the Tianmen Square and broadcast to warn the people to leave. I want to persuade the students with job, but a lot of students don't want to do that. My seeing the crowd is shouting at the sky. The crowd is so big that my ears are getting so dizzy. I can't breathe. This kind of thing. At the beginning, I think they try to avoid the real violent end. But then you have a lot of the, the cars or maybe trucks were stormed by, by the pit bull. To bring out the People's Liberation Army on the people, the PLA, we have to emphasize, shocked, horrified, everyone. That was not something, they, how could you do that? When you send in tags, you're going to cause deaths. Tags to arrest individual people, they roll over dozens of people all at the same time. There might have been a triumph for the hardliners, but then they had betrayed their Confucian background, hadn't they? Because in this whole hierarchical notion of the universe, where benefits must flow down before respect can flow up, and the young must revere and respect the older people at the top, the kickback to all of that is, you cannot kill your children. that Deng really wanted to use economic growth as a way of maintaining stability in China. I mean, you mentioned you worked with him, you knew him. What seemed to be his personal mission as, as a man and as a leader, just through, from your personal experience having known him? Deng Xiaoping called himself the son of the Chinese nation, and I think he really meant it. He wanted to have the Chinese people getting rich, live a better life, and he would work very hard to push China in the right direction. Under him, pragmatism uh, was very much emphasized and practice became the real test of the truth. Ever since 1978, China had two pillars to stand upon. One is maintaining stability at all cost. The second pillar is to keep peace at all cost. Whatever that happened in Beijing in 1989 was a great tragedy. Uh, whether the situation could have been handled better? Yes, of course. Everyone in China now should learn that lesson, that we cannot have a revolution. If you have an opinion, you have a grievance, if you have a suggestion, etc., say that in a peaceful way. Don't resort to violence. Don't resort to revolution. Whatever big lesson that the Chinese nation learned in 1989, 
gave rise to the subsequent 30 years or so of very rapid economic development in China. We as a nation should be grateful that China did not disintegrate or did not collapse as a result of whatever that happened in Beijing in 1989. What we have heard is just one reading of what happened in 1989, and that reading is by no means shared by every Chinese. So there's no such a thing as a Chinese nation has an agreed reading of what happened in 1989. What you have just mentioned is a rather official interpretation, official that's narrative. That's my interpretation. Great. Then that's uh, your kind of agreement with the official narratives about what happened in 1989. After 1989, the Communist Party still desired to stay in power forever, but fully aware it lost a lot of legitimacy with the people. So how to do uh, the, how to accomplish the goal of staying in power forever? You try to please people. So after 1989, the Communist Party adopted two things that are quite important that has some positive uh, consequence, as you mentioned, economic development and uh, letting the free enterprise grow and so on. That's called a populist tool. Another tool is they really tighten up the social control and management. Deng Xiaoping was a pragmatic and also a great tactician in a sense that he le really took that legalist prescription uh, to the full extreme. He clearly was very pragmatic and he did care about getting China to develop and modernize and be rich and be powerful. But he's also never given up on making, keeping China within the communist framework and using the party as the key instrument to deliver that. And in terms of international policy, I think what Felix said is very right. Deng Xiaoping was a master strategist. He followed the old uh, Leninist maxims that the capitalist world will sell you the rope to hang themselves. And he completely capitalized on that and play on the generosity of the United States, Europe and Japan to help China to modernize. And the unspoken part of it, which is that when we are ready, we will roar. China had been biding its time learning lessons from its past for almost 5,000 years. Successes and failures seared into the soul of a nation. History were purposed as policy. The 20th century was drawing to a close, and China was once again daring to be a great world power. People need to look at the central government for the restoration of stability and order. Xi Jinping is on the way to become an almighty dominant figure. China, from an American perspective, is a rising strategic threat. It will be rich, it will be powerful, it will be second to none. In the minds of an authoritarian dictator, the last thing you do is back down. <laughs> 